And with that, we have a lot to get to, and so I'll invite you, if you're not already there, to turn to Philippians, the third chapter. Our text today is going to be verses 12 through 16. Uh, If you're able, I'll ask you to stand. You can follow along as I read. If not, that's all right. Where you're seated is fine. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church there in Philippi, and by the Spirit of God says, verse 12, not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, verse 13, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us, verse 15, then, who are mature, should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. Let's pray if you would join with me. We'll ask God's blessing on our understanding. Loving Heavenly Father, we are so grateful to you for this time that we have together in your word this morning. And we're also very grateful to you because the Holy Spirit is the one who gives us understanding and opens up the eyes of our understanding to hear what it is that you would have us, your church, to hear. So Lord, we're gonna ask you to speak very clearly into our lives, in and through your word. We ask you for this in Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated, thank you. So, uh, what I want to talk about today is something that I believe is one of the most destructive dynamics in our lives as Christians. And it's that of what has happened in the past and the guilt and condemnation that the enemy always packages with it in order to distance us from the Lord. It's important to understand that the tactics, the strategies of Satan change once we come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Prior to coming to the Lord, the enemy is all about keeping us from the Lord. But once we come to Christ, then his strategy changes, and now he's all about distancing us from the Lord, creating a destructive dynamic in our lives that will accomplish this. And this is what Satan does, is he seeks to steal kill and destroy and one of the ways he does this is to crush us under the weight of our past. Jesus in John's gospel the 10th chapter verse 10 said that the thief the enemy does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy but He says, I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Simply put, and I hope this is not an oversimplification, but the past can destroy the present, even the future. And if there was ever a man who could speak to this, it was the Apostle Paul. And I think you know why. Make no mistake about it. The enemy would have continually reminded Paul of all the times 
that he had Christians imprisoned and even killed. It's my belief that it was his approval of the death of Stephen, the first martyr of the church that haunted Paul the most. This was the one time that I believe the enemy tried to destroy Paul. It's recorded in Acts chapter 7, verses 54 through chapter 8, verse 3. We're told that as they dragged Stephen out of the city to stone him to death, the witnesses laid their coats at a young Saul's feet. What's interesting is that while they were stoning him, Stephen's last words were actually a prayer. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Reminiscent of the prayer the Savior would pray when on the cross, Lord, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. I would suggest that Saul heard that prayer and that made an impact on one Saul of Tarsus at this time. We're also told that Saul approved of Stephen's killing and after he was killed, Saul began to destroy the church going from house to house dragging off both men and women to put them into prison. Can you imagine having a past like that? Can you imagine the regret that would have come packaged with something like that? This is when he was young. It's believed that at the time he wrote this epistle to the Philippians that he had been walking with the Lord for some 30 years. And he had been in the ministry for some 25 years. So think about this. He's reflecting back on a time when he was much younger, at least 25, well, 30 years younger, and what he did when he was young. Well, this begs the question that I want to try to tackle today and it's the question of, how was Paul the apostle able to forget his past as Saul of Tarsus? Perhaps more importantly, I think the question that we need to answer is, how can we forget our past? Thankfully, the apostle Paul is going to rise from the pages of our Bibles and by the Spirit, he's going to answer this for us as an example to us of how we too can forget the past, forget that which is behind, the sins of the past, the regrets of the past. So what follows are two very practical ways that we as Christians can stop dwelling on living in the past, and start living that life that Jesus said he came to give. That abundant life, that fulfilling life, that whole life, or if you prefer, holy life. The first one is found in verses 12 through 14, and it's to press on. Here, Paul says that he himself has not arrived, nor has he attained to that which Christ had taken hold of him. He's speaking, I believe, of this goal of winning the prize using this sports metaphor, actually from the early Olympic Games as we know them today, back in that day, and it carries with it this idea of he's just pressing on, pushing forward, not looking back, forgetting that which is behind him, pressing on, looking forward, and sort of like he's leaning into the tape at the finish line. That's what he's talking about. 
And the reason he's talking about this is because this is his calling. This is our calling heavenward in Christ Jesus, which should be the reason why we forget the past and press on. Don't dwell on the past. Don't live in the past. It is again, and you'll forgive the repetitive nature of what I'm about to say, but it is, I believe, one of the most destructive dynamics in the life of a Christian. It's also one of the most destructive dynamics in the life of a Christian marriage. Bringing up the past. And it's evidenced by two words. These are two very deadly words. You know what they are? Wait for it. (laughs) Here it comes. Always and never. Those are past words. You always do that. You never do this. Oh, we're keeping a record? Oh, yeah. You want to see it? Roll out the scroll. I've got it in Microsoft Word. The file's too big. I had to put it on a bigger flash drive. (laughs) I can download it for you if you want. 300 pages in length. Don't you think, think about this and think through this with me. Don't you think that the enemy would love nothing more than to get us to always think about and dwell on the past? You understand why he would do that? You know, Jesus actually raises the bar on this in Luke's gospel, chapter 9, verse 62. Listen to what he says. He says, no one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. In other words, what Jesus is saying is that we are unfit dare I say, disqualified to be his servants if and when we're always looking back instead of plowing forward. Now, the context of this is when there were those to whom Jesus would say, follow me, and they came up with all of these excuses. Oh, you know, I got to take care of my family estate. Uh, I got to take care of some unfinished matters. And they didn't follow Jesus. And this is why. Let me hasten to say that even dwelling on the good things in the past have the propensity to cripple us. And this by virtue of how we can become puffed up in our pride. In other words, it works both ways, right? Our past victories can make us proud and our past sins can cripple us in condemnation and the enemy knows that and he'll work both sides of the table in our lives. I'll never forget many, many years ago I was in Russia and I was teaching at the Bible college in Moscow and the students that were in the class, we would every night go out and do an outreach. And on this one particular night, we had, I mean, God moved in a mighty way, standing room only. They tried to shut us down, all of these young. It was, it was amazing. I reflect back on this to this day, and this has been, I don't know how many, 20-some years ago now. And people got saved and God blessed and it was just so powerful. So the next morning when I was doing the morning devotions with the students, I made this comment. I said, you know, last night was amazing, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. God really moved, didn't he? Yeah, he did. Well, here's the thing. Satan couldn't be happier. And they all looked at me like, you mean God couldn't be happier? You, you just, you said Satan couldn't be happier. I said, no, 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 no. That's what I meant. You want to know why? Because 
It's always on the heels of some great victory that Satan is patiently waiting for us to come down from that mountaintop and there he is saying things like this, wow, that was pretty good last night. Yeah. Wow. That was pretty amazing. God really moved, didn't he? Yeah. Hey, you did good. Yeah, I kind of did a little bit. And there he is, just kind of feeding into that. And we're all too ready, right? To glory in the flesh, like as if we had something to do with it. Yeah, that was pretty good. Man, that invitation that I gave, whoo! Glory! See, I can do that now because I have this microphone instead of that one. <laughs> That's not to say that we don't reflect on those times that God did amazing things in our lives. It's just that the danger is we have this sin nature and this proclivity to begin to glory in it and take the credit for it. And Satan is all too ready to use that against us. I see it. I've seen it over the years where God has used somebody mightily and then they end up resting on their laurels. And all they ever talk about is what God did back in the day. Listen, I, I appreciate that. Praise the Lord for that. But let's talk about what God's doing now. And let's talk about what God's going to do yet future. What, you're going to rest on that? You're going to frame that, put it in your office and glory in that? It's only when we keep our hands to the plow, or as Paul says it, keep pressing on and leaning into that tape at the finish line that we're fit to serve, fit to follow, if you will. And wouldn't you agree that when we're so busy pressing on, moving forward, that we don't have time to look back? Let me say the same thing in a different way. Isn't it logical to conclude that if we're so busy in the Spirit, in step with the Spirit, walking in the Spirit, pressing on in the Spirit, we don't have time for the flesh, we're too busy. Idle hands are still the devil's workshop, as the saying goes. And I think we do err greatly when we don't busy ourselves with the things of God because there's a default. It's almost like we default like this magnetic pull when we're not busy in the things of the Spirit, then there's all this time for the works of the flesh. Listen, if I'm too busy about the things of God, I don't have time. And by the way, when Paul writes to the Galatians, as we talked about when we were studying through Galatians, about if you walk in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh, that always kind of um, didn't make sense to me early on in my Christian walk. And then the Lord really blessed it to my heart and the application of it to my life when he showed me that what he means is if you're so busy about the things of God, the things of the flesh, the things of this world, they, you just don't have time. They clamor for our attention, don't they? But I'm too busy. I think of Nehemiah. When Sambalat and Tobiah, the Arabs, you've got to watch out for them Arabs, um, <laughs> tried to trick him, and they had this, this uh, plot to get him to meet with them. They were actually planning to kill him because they didn't want to see the work of God continue and the wall be built. They were going to do everything they could 
to stop it. So they go to Nehemiah and they say, hey, we need to meet. We need to talk this out. Come on. And I love what Nehemiah says. You know what? No. I'm too busy. I don't have time for that. Buzz off. That's not in the original language, but uh, (laughs) basically he says, get out of my face, man. I'm too busy doing the work of God. I'm too busy about the things of God. I don't have time for you. I don't have time for that. So the next time the devil comes knocking on your door and says, hey, look at this. I don't have time. What about that? No, I don't have time. What about that? No, I, I forgot about that. And so is God, by the way. It's been said that when Satan reminds you of your past, just remind him of his future. You're a defeated foe. Get out. You're a liar. You're a liar. You get out. Because, see, Satan puts those thoughts in our minds, and that's the second way to forget the past, and it's to think differently. In verses 15 and 16, Paul refers to how growing in grace and maturing in Christ changes us, renews us to the point of thinking differently. Now, we're going to be talking more in depth about this when we get to chapter 4, specifically verses 6 through 8, where Paul says to be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. And in that peace of God, that surpasses, bypasses human understanding and comprehension will keep your hearts and minds, minds in Christ Jesus. And then he says in verse 8, actually lists in verse 8, all the things that we're to think on, things that are of a good report, things that are true, not a lie. You know what our problem is? I think it was G. Campbell Morgan who said, We'll listen to the devil's lies and not listen to the Lord's truth and the word of truth. And when we listen to those lies, we end up believing those lies. And the battlegrounds in the mind, see, Satan cannot read our mind, but he certainly can put thoughts in our mind. And that's what he does. And the battleground is in the mind. And this is why it is that having the mind of Christ, thinking on those things, whatsoever things are pure and just and of a good report and holy, think on those things. Scripture is replete with passage after passage promise after promise concerning the mind, are we not to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, soul, and mind? But see, the problem is our mind has fallen. Paul, writing to the Corinthians in his second epistle, chapter 10, verse 5, said, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And listen, we take captive Every thought to make it obedient to Christ. What does that mean? What it means is that we have to catch that thought before it's met with the supple soil of our mind to germinate and sprout. We need to catch it and examine it. Say, wait a minute, wait, 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 wait. Not so fast, thought. Let's just make sure that This is compatible with obedient to the word of Christ, the word of God. Is it biblical? Is it true? If it's not true, get out! It's not true. That's a lie. The only thing that's going to come into my mind that I'm going to catch before it's entered into my mind, it has to be the truth. And the father of lies is always a thousand, ten thousand times a day trying to plant lies into our mind that are not obedient to the word of Christ. Romans 12, verses 1 and 2, two of my favorite verses. 
in all of Scripture, along with all the other <laughs> verses in all of Scripture. But listen to what Paul says, verse 2. He says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, listen, by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. But this is predicated upon one condition, and that one condition is not conforming to the pattern of this world, but instead transforming your mind by the renewing of your mind. How do you do that? Oh, the Word of God. It's not brainwashing, it's washing the brain with the water of God's Word. It cleanses. It purifies. Can't wait on Thursday nights. We're in the book of Psalms. Cannot wait to get to Psalm 119, the longest chapter in all of the Bible. We'll probably spend a year there if the rapture doesn't happen first, but <laughs> really looking forward to that. It's all about the Word of God what the Word of God is, what the Word of God does, and how powerful the Word of God is. Well, before I bring it to a close, I think I would be grossly remiss if I didn't speak to this matter of being deeply hurt by someone in the past. Maybe in your past, it's not so much what you did, it's more about what has been done to you. I would venture to say that there's not a single one of us who have not been on the receiving end of some form of abuse or betrayal, having been deeply hurt at the hands of someone else who we tr really trusted, we're really close to. Those are deep hurts. And they can stay with you for the rest of your life if you let them. Here's the problem when you do. The writer of Hebrews says it best. If you allow that to fester inside of you, it'll destroy you. It'll destroy you mentally. It'll destroy you physically. I'm reading a book right now. In fact, I hope to talk more about what God's really ministering to me when we get to chapter four, but it's about the damage and destruction that is caused to our bodies through pain, through stress, through fear, through anxiety. And it has to do with our God-given adrenaline. And when there's no recovery, how it just, I mean, it'll destroy the digestive system. Certainly it's the cause of many heart problems, heart disease. You know, I always think of it this way, that whenever God says something, it's always because he loves us and he doesn't want to see us hurt unnecessarily. It's like one called the Ten Commandments, the Tender Commandments. Thou shalt not do this because I love you so much, I can't stand to see what will happen to you if you do that. It's been said that sin is not bad because it's forbidden. Sin is forbidden because it's bad. It's bad for us. It brings harm to us. And this again, and you'll forgive me for repeating it, but this is one of the most destructive things in our lives. It's the crushing weight of our past. And so here's what happens, the writer of Hebrews says. If we let that just fester 
and we nurture it, and that little seed of bitterness from that past hurt at the hands of someone in our lives, it begins to grow and it'll bear a bitter fruit that will defile you. That's what it does to you. It'll basically destroy you in every arena of your life. So what's the answer? I, please, I in no way want to sound like I'm being dismissive of what has happened to you. But I do want to say this, and this is what God ministered to me over the years when I've suffered at the hands of someone else. And just like the next guy, I'm just as prone to begin to just dwell on it seethe over it. There came a point in my life where the Lord basically ministered to me that if I didn't do something about it, it would destroy my life, it would destroy my ministry, it would destroy my marriage. Almost did, I'm sad to say, very sad to say. But God... <laughs> God, as only he can, afresh and anew, reminded me of this. It's not what's been done to you. It's what's been done for you. Wait, what do you mean? See, I'm thinking about all the time what they did to me. I can't believe they did that to me. And here's the Savior, my Jesus, saying, I know how that feels, by the way, because they did that to me too. I was betrayed. <laughs> Lord, you were betrayed infinitely more so than I was. I'm sorry, Lord. But I forgave them. Yes, you did. I want to forgive them. Well, you can forgive them with the forgiveness that you have also received from the Lord for what you've done. Yeah, but Lord, it, it hurt me so bad. I know. I was hurting so bad in such emotional and physical pain that I perspired my own blood. I didn't do that, I know. But see, I died for you. I rose again from the dead, defeating death for you, paying in full for all of your sin and theirs too. It's not what's been done to you. Get your eyes off of that. Stop dwelling on that. Stop thinking about that and instead you think on what I did for you because of my love for you. What I endured for you and instead of you. That's what we celebrate on the first Sunday of each month as we're going to today, the communion table. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you. Thank you for the Apostle Paul's example to us of forgetting what's behind and pressing on heavenward to the prize of the high calling to which you've called us to. Lord, I pray especially for anyone here today that has been living in the past and it's really been destroying them. I pray that today you would free them from the shackles and that when they leave this church today, they will leave differently than the way they came today because who you set free 
is free indeed. In Jesus' name, amen.